And we are recording. I don't know if it gives you an indicator of that. Yep. A little All right. Red light. Seven o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started. Go through the preliminaries. Have a few caveats I want to go through before we dig too far into this. First is that I've been using Lightroom for 13 years. Came out in 2007, uh, but I don't know everything about it. I use it for what I need. I use it the way I use it, and there are better ways of doing some things. There, so don't assume that everything I say is gospel. If you have a different way of doing something, if you're already a Lightroom user and you see things differently, shout it out. Feel free to speak up. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. I mean, if there's no interactivity in this, it's really not any better than watching a YouTube video, which I'm sure there's several that are better out there. Um, another caveat is there's sort of three versions of Lightroom. There's Lightroom 6, which was the last one that they sold. Put you can just on. buy a perpetual license to the software. That's dead now. They don't update it. And I don't think you can buy it anymore. There's Lightroom Classic, which is what I'll be showing, and it's what everybody I know uses. And there's Lightroom CC, and that's sort of Adobe's cloud-based Lightroom. And I think some people use a lot of mobile stuff, use it for some things. I don't know these people. The problem is you've got all of your images stored in the cloud. And if you take a lot of pictures, that's a lot of storage that you have to pay for and manage. So I don't use that. Um, and then just to repeat again, just because I say I do something a certain way, doesn't mean it's the right way. Doesn't mean it's the only way. Feel free to do things however you want. There's no right or wrong. Well, there's some wrong answers, but there's not one right answer. And then the last thing I want to add before we start is that I'm a PC person. Uh, a lot of people who use Lightroom use it on the Mac. As a matter of fact, I would say the majority of tutorial videos you watch for Lightroom and Photoshop will be on uh, Mac rather than PC. I don't remember all the lingo exactly right, but whenever I say Alt, that I think means Option on the Mac. When I say Control, that means Command on the Mac. And I'll also talk about right-clicking sometimes. I don't know what that means on the Mac. But <laughs> just bring up your context off menu. OK, so what is Lightroom? At its heart, Lightroom is a catalog. It's it's a database. It's it, it's not just a tool for processing your pictures. It does that. It's a basic photo editor. It's not nearly as powerful as Photoshop, but it's a tool to store all your pictures, to organize them, to be able to quickly find them, be able to quickly go through them, and be able to process them. When it first came out, I would say about 20% of the pictures I took, I still had to go into Photoshop to do something. Lightroom has improved enough to where, aside from printing, which I prefer to do in Photoshop, but a lot of people prefer to do in Lightroom, I only go into Photoshop now when I'm trying to do something like compositing pictures or doing something very unusual. So I don't use Photoshop nearly as much as I used to. Uh, aside from the catalog aspect of it, the database aspect of it, and the photo editing, Lightroom also lets you print pictures. Uh, it lets you plot them on a map. It lets you create books and slideshows and websites. I do almost none of those things in Lightroom, so I'm really not going to talk that much about them. The heart of it is the cataloging part, which is what we're going to cover tonight, the library module. And if anybody wants to come back next week, we'll cover the editing or develop module where you can actually change your pictures. You can't buy Lightroom anymore. You can subscribe to it. Adobe has a subscription package. I believe it's $120 a year. They like to say $10 a month, but if you pay for it by month, it's more expensive than that. It's $120 a year, and that covers Photoshop and Lightroom. So it's a good deal if you use it a lot, and it's a bad deal if you don't. Okay, so let's talk about just kind of how this is organized. You've got several different panes on the screen. This section on the right side, let me minimize you guys, is a pane. This is a pane. When I say a pane, I can drag and resize it. I can hide it and make it appear. And I've got a pane down at the bottom. And then I've got all this stuff in the middle. 
With a second monitor, you can move this stuff in the middle off to another monitor uh, and work, work it that way. Uh, it's a little more efficient, but Lightroom kind of grew out of the, in the single monitor days and it seems to be still designed more with single monitors in mind. The first pane I want to talk about is this left-hand pane. I'm going to call that the, the organizing pane. Let's ignore the navigator for a minute because it doesn't really fit in with the rest of the stuff on the pane, but you've got catalogs, folders, collections, and publishing services. And a catalog, it's a bit of a misnomer. All of your pictures in Lightroom are inside of one catalog. That's your, your database. My catalog, I've got 286,868 pictures. You can have multiple catalogs. You can go up here and you can open up a different catalog, you create catalogs people start to think that they should have multiple catalogs for maybe, I don't know, their vacation pictures go in one catalog. Don't do that. Just put all your pictures in one catalog. You've got everything there and you have other ways of organizing things. The only reason you would want to use multiple catalogs is if you really need to keep things physically separate for a good logical reason, you never go between the two. So the only cases I could think of were Maybe a professional photographer wants to keep their personal catalog separate from their work catalog. Or maybe you've got stuff that's just super sensitive that you want to keep in a special catalog just so that it doesn't appear in your other catalog. If you've got super sensitive pictures like that, I don't want to, I don't want to know what they are, but that's your business. <laughs> um, but within the catalog, it gives you these ways of kind of looking at things. And we'll go through these. Uh, well, let's just go through them now. One is you can see all of your pictures. You can see all of your synced photographs. And I don't know what that means. I think it means all of the pictures you have that are synced with their cloud service, particularly if you're using Lightroom Classic and Lightroom CC. I don't use that. You've got a quick collection. And that's just an easy way. As you're going through pictures, you see this little dot on the picture? If I click on that dot, it will add that picture to the quick collection. And if I click on it again, it will take it out of the quick collection. Uh, and it's, a, it's an easy way to kind of grab a bunch of pictures and put them together. Let's say you're putting together a slideshow to commemorate an event or something, and you want to go grab pictures from different places. It's, it's sort of a quick ad hoc way to grab things. It's also got a section here for previous import. Uh, I deleted everything from like test import I did. We'll see that when we import pictures, but it's just an easy way of when you bring pictures in, going back seeing just what did I bring in? All this will make more sense as we start digging through cat or collections soon. It's got a folder section here. And this is, this mirrors what you have on your hard drive or your computer. You can have stuff on external drives, your hard drive, network, wherever. This is just where they're physically stored. And if you haven't used Lightroom, you probably think you're going to be in here. This is where you're going to go find your pictures and organize your pictures. You really don't. This is, I only go here when something's wrong and I'm trying to find things. Or for some reason, I want to reorganize how my pictures are stored. I don't. I keep all my pictures in one spot. Um, and then I just have them organized by year and then within there by month, within there by day. Uh, a lot of people hate organizing things by time. However you want to organize stuff on your disk that works for you is fine. But when you're within Lightroom, you're not going to be using this section much. What you're going to be using is your collections section. Oops. Um, and this is your way to organize pictures into whatever sort of groups you want. I mean, we'll look at vacations. I have vacations and then within a given year, I'll have different trips in there. Uh, and I could go look at that and I can see all the pictures from there. One of the nice things about collections, is that a picture can appear in multiple collections. So I can have collections here of my vacations, but then I can also have collections here of my prints and some of these nature prints, for example, are pictures that I took on vacations. So this picture would appear in my Canada vacation collection. I can right click on it, say go to collections. Okay, I'm wrong, it doesn't. Oh, it's because I made a separate virtual copy. And I'll explain those in a minute. 
but you can have individual pictures that appear in lots of different collections. So you don't, it's not like a folder where the file's got to be in one place and only one place, or you have to make a separate copy of the file. You can have one picture, not copies of it, but one picture appear in multiple places. You can also have these higher level things like vacation, 1993. These aren't collections. It's only these things down here that are collections. Um, and these other things are called collection sets. So when you want to go add a new collection set, you just come here and you tell it, I want to add a collection set. And then you tell it what information you want, where you want it to go. And that kind of builds out this structure, this framework for you. Once again, everybody's got different ways of organizing things. Uh, mine's not very good, but it works for me. It's how I find things. Uh, whatever works for you, for your structure, uh, you know, knock yourself out. You've got, in addition to collections, you also have smart collections. Like this is a smart collection I put together of pictures that aren't in any collection at all. So if I put a picture in a collection, it will disappear from here. But if it's not in a collection, it'll appear in here. I could have other smart collections. You know, what are my pictures that I rate five stars? What are pictures that I've taken in the last month? Uh, what are pictures that I've recently modified, done something to? You, you sort of create, you create these smart collections and you tell it what sort of filtering criteria you want to use. You know, do I want pictures taken with a particular camera or Mitchell? set of cameras or in a particular state or, you know, whatever sort of criteria you want. It's just an easy way to have collections that automatically get pictures added to them. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, you said pictures that were in that smart collection, if you put them in some other collection, they'll disappear. Can you explain why that is? Well, that's just this one collection. This one is this called one. not yeah. in a collection. Right. Um, and it's set to filter to, there wasn't an easy way to filter to things that aren't in a collection, but I says, okay, give me any collection that doesn't contain any letter or number, which I suppose if I create a collection just named ampersand dollar sign pound sign or something and put pictures in there, they wouldn't appear in here. But for every real collection I have, this will have every picture that I don't have. And I put this together as a way to go through and make sure that I get every picture into an appropriate collection. Obviously, I still have 22,000 to go, so I'm not done with that yet. Uh, okay, another question. Okay. Why use a smart collection rather than a regular collection? I guess, can you explain the difference between those two? So a regular collection will take um, our honeymoon here. It's just a collection that I manually assign pictures into. I have to drag each picture Aww. or set of pictures into here or, or somehow tell it those pictures are going to go into that collection. That's the way I tend to organize things. But if you really keyword the heck out of things, you could do away with a lot of your collections and just have smart collections. And the advantage there is you don't have to add pictures there manually. So okay. you'll probably end up with a mixture of the two. My guess is you want your fundamental organization to be regular collections, but you may mm -hmm. want to have, you know, instead of having like a print section here, you may keyword your pictures in a way that they'll automatically show up for ones that I've made ready to print, or, you know, maybe you'll have some smart collections here around different families or different groups that people, you might, for example, want to have, lots of pictures in lots of different places that involve the Maker Barn, but you may want to have a smart collection that just is recent Maker Barn pictures. And you would look for any picture that you keyworded Maker Barn and any picture that has a timestamp within the last, say, three months. Uh, and then you wouldn't have to maintain that collection. Any picture that you put in that you tag as part of the Maker Barn uh, and that was taken in the last three months will automatically appear in there. So the smart collections are useful when it meets some sort of criteria you want to automatically have set up, but the regular collections are where you sort of manually organize things. In your workflow, Mark, do you normally tag those as you're importing from your cards, or do you tag? Do you go through and you manually tag, add keywords, metadata to each image? So 
when you import pictures, and we'll get to that in a minute, you can tell it which catalog to put things into, and you can even create a catalog at that time. I would recommend that as kind of best practice. Uh, I don't do that all the time, which is how I end up with a lot of pictures not in collections, uh, but that's the way to do it. And then keywording, in an ideal world, when you import your pictures, you would go through them thoroughly and keyword everything and do all that. Keywording's a pain. Uh, I have not kept up with my keywording very well. Uh, getting, I'm spending a lot more time going through and keywording old pictures and trying to get all that set up, but it's a fairly laborious process. And when we get into it, I'll talk a little bit about the fact that Adobe doesn't help you that much. You know, if I drop pictures into Google Photos, and I come back the next day, it has automatically figured out everything about that picture. It knows that that's a tent in the picture and that's a bike in the picture and okay, would have no clue what that thing behind Kathy is, but that's a paddle. I could keyword that manually in uh, in Google Photos. Self-defense uh, paddle. Yes, yeah, there's a lot of bears out there. This is in Yellowstone, so. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> now we were, that day we canoed down a river and had parked our bikes at the end so we could ride back up to our car. And we didn't want to leave the paddles with the canoe, so. Yeah, it wasn't kind of a traditional honeymoon as you would expect. But doing all your keywording when you put your pictures in is a fantastic thing to do. And I completely say you should do it. Uh, and if you do that, you either take far fewer pictures than I do, or you're a better person than I am. So. Probably less pictures than you. <laughs> Could be a little bold. Uh, the last thing you have on here is published services. And these kind of have their own collections. And these are ways that you get pictures to different services. I use Smug Mug to host my pictures. So I use this one a lot. I still have the Facebook one in here, but it doesn't work anymore. Facebook blocked that. Um, I don't use Flickr. But it's a built-in one. I don't use Adobe Stock. It's built in. Uh, I got a third-party one for Instagram. They're all The problem with these is they're all different. So I don't want to spend a lot of time showing you how these work other than to say, if you host your pictures somewhere, find the plugin, uh, the publish service for that by going here and going to go to publish manager, find the service and figure out how to make it work. It's a lot easier to just go directly from Lightroom to there uh, to publish your pictures. It's also good because if you modify your pictures, it will know that. And then for a lot of them, it can just republish them without having to go delete the pictures and re-add them and do all that stuff. So um, it's not perfect, but it's helpful. Okay, let's go through and import pictures so you can see how that part of the process works. You can either click on this import button here or you can go to file, import photos and videos. The button's easier. I always use the menu because the button didn't exist 13 years ago and that's where I learned my habits. Oh, I need to plug in my memory card. You can set it up so that anytime you plug in a camera or memory card, it will automatically uh, try and import. That drives me insane, so I don't have that turned on. Okay, so let's talk about what you see in this import window. First of all, you've got these four options. Copy is DNG, copy, move, and add. Copy is what I use almost every time. And what it does is it takes the pictures that you've got on your memory card or your camera, and it makes a copy of them into a folder somewhere and you'll tell it where down in this destination part and it loads them into the Lightroom database. Move does the exact same thing. The difference is that it will delete them off of your camera or your memory card. Oh, so wow. nine times out of 10, that's what you want anyway. So I suppose a lot of people would be tempted to use move. I'm always just afraid something's gonna go wrong. So I don't delete them off of my memory card until I'm sure I've got them into Lightroom. I'm sure that they came across fine because every now and then one will come across and it won't read right. You have these weird pink swaths on the picture. and um, It's just, to me, I like to copy them on there and then go delete them later. But it does the same thing. Add is a weird beast. Add is a case where you already have them on your computer and you already have them where you want them to be, but they're not in Lightroom. In that case, Lightroom will add them to the catalog, but it won't actually move the file, It'll just leave the file where it is. 
And that's probably, if you've already got a lot of pictures and you've got them organized the way you want to keep things organized on your computer, that's the way I would start is just to add all my existing pictures. Um, but day to day, when you're grabbing new pictures that you've taken, you're going to use either copy or mood, depending on how confident you are. And then this copy is DNG. DNG is a somewhat raw file format that Adobe has. It has a few advantages over a regular camera raw file uh, in that it can store more metadata. It's something that's somewhat universal. So there's a good chance that if you're using some odd camera that 30 years from now, nobody will be able to read the raw pictures from it. But if you make them a DNG, there's a much better chance that people will be able to. But it, it's not a true raw file. So I flirted with them for a while, but I don't use them. I just use the copy. In this case, they're all JPEG, so it doesn't really matter anyway. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and copy these to my machine though. We'll, we'll go through that in a minute. One thing about that I, that I should add, particularly with JPEGs is if you use a photo editor like Photoshop and you edit a JPEG file, JPEGs use what's called lossy compression. That is, it, it stores the picture very efficiently. It doesn't use a lot of space, but it does that by trying to figure out what information is important and what's not. And it throws out the stuff that's not that important. And the lower your quality setting, the smaller the file and the more information it'll throw out. The problem is even if you use a high quality setting, if you repeatedly open up that JPEG file, edit it and save it, it's gonna get worse and worse with every iteration. It's gonna lose more information. The image is gonna degrade. Try it with a, like a piece of text sometime, like a, a scan page and just open it in paint or something, edit it in a trivial way and save it and repeat that process. And you'll see after just four or five iterations, it starts to really look ugly. Lightroom doesn't do that because Lightroom doesn't actually edit the pictures. It's what's called a parametric editor. It saves, when you edit a picture, it saves all the steps you took. And then when you bring that picture back up in Lightroom or you export it, it takes the original picture and it applies those steps to it again so that you never impact the original file. So when I bring these things in, I'm comfortable bringing them in as JPEGs rather than converting them to some other format because I know that I'm not actually gonna be editing those JPEGs. I'm only gonna be adding more information on top of those edits. Okay, so this is something if you don't mind me interrupting um, sure, the I love the way you explain the like the dynamic collection. So even though the file exists in one directory, you can you can have it exist in multiple locations. But this parametric uh, editing, it, it just had me curious, what is your Lightroom cache file size? Like, are we talking hundreds of gigabytes or how does um, that work? So there's, there's several parts of that. There's the file storage itself, the photos, um, and those just are what they are. Then there's your Lightroom catalog, and we can go look at that. And if you'll notice if you look at the disk sizes, I tend to use a lot of space for stuff, so. On my screen, I'm just seeing Lightroom. I don't know if I, okay. everybody else can see it. Okay, I'm, yeah, I'm just going through my uh, file system right now trying to find my catalog so I can tell you how big it is. Okay, not including backups of the catalog. For 300, almost 300,000 pictures, I've used seven gigabytes in Lightroom. Wow. So okay. not much. The editing space doesn't take up much space. The pictures, on the other hand, are somewhere yeah. around 10 terabytes. A lot yeah. of that's video though. That's another yeah. caveat I should add is Lightroom works with video files, sort of. You can import them, you can catalog them, you can keyword them, but you can't do any developing of them. And maybe it works better on a Mac, but when I try and preview the videos in Lightroom, it's awful and it's just super slow. So. I, I load my video files into Lightroom just for cataloging purposes, but I don't even think about working with them there. Okay. Good. 
So I guess now the, the, the corrections that you're making when you process the, the, the pictures, that's stored in a file other than the JPEG, right? So right. Have, is that stored in the catalog or is that? That's stored in the catalog. You can also have it write what's called an XMP file. That's oh, okay. a little file that gets the same name as the JPEG or raw file or whatever, TIFF file, whatever file you're using. It gets an XMP, what they call a sidecar file. And that also has the Lightroom information in it. Okay, so you have to be careful if you're copying stuff to another computer or something like that to make sure everything gets moved over. Huh? <laughs> so we'll talk about that when you go to exporting, but there's two ways you export. One is you export the pictures, which with they get processed and you sort of export the output. The other is you export a catalog. You set up a set of pictures and you export those and then they get all the Lightroom information and they are their own catalog. And that's useful if you're working with two people that have Lightroom and you wanna give them what you've got. Uh, they get the pictures and all the edits and keyword stuff you've done uh, when they import it into their catalog or you can use it as a standalone catalog. Again though, People who are new to Lightroom are often tempted to have lots of catalogs. You should generally always only have one catalog unless you have a really good reason to have more than one catalog. Okay, so back to this screen. This source section here just lets me pick where, do I, where am I getting the pictures from. Usually it'll have your camera or your memory cards up here in the devices section. If it doesn't, that's a sign that it's not plugged in right or you haven't something's wrong there. Then it also has the ability to grab things from your file system. Um, I just generally always pick the one up here. And this eject after import just means that when it's done importing, it's gonna eject logically that memory card so you can safely unplug it. And so that if you go back to import again, it won't reappear on your list. Unless you unplug it and plug it back in. On this side of the screen over here, you've got information about what you wanna do with it. The first thing is building previews. Lightroom stores previews and those are not in the catalog. Well, actually, there's a cache that's not in the catalog that I've not shown you. Um, and it will put previews in there. And that's when you're going through Lightroom, it makes it much faster if it's got a preview to work with rather than having to go open up the full photo file itself and go process it every time. If you don't have previews and you're scrolling through your pictures one at a time and looking at them in relatively high resolution, it gets annoyingly slow. Standard previews are fine for screen resolution stuff, but if you're going through your pictures and you're frequently zooming into them, you wanna see them at you know full detail, then you'll wanna build one-to-one -one previews. I've never, I never use uh, minimal or embedded in sidecar previews, so I, I can't really speak to those. But if you don't build previews, the process is really, really slow. If you do build previews, it works a lot faster. Uh, build smart previews, I have this checked. I did some reading about it because it's relatively new and I didn't understand it. It builds a separate set of previews that Lightroom can also use that have, the, the cool feature is that you can edit the pictures just based on the preview, even though you don't have access to the photos themselves. Why would you do something like that? Well, imagine that you work off of a laptop and most of your photos are stored on external drives. You can import them in, have it uh, build the previews there, and then you could still, if you're traveling, you don't have to bring your external drive, you could work off of those um, previews that it has there. I don't do that, I have a desktop that I can't even lift, so it's not, something that's interesting to me. Um, and I think they also use the smart previews for the syncing to the cloud stuff. Uh, I'm just gonna leave that unchecked from now on. This don't import suspected duplicates is an important thing to leave checked. If you import a set of pictures and then you go take more pictures and you forget to erase your card, you go import them again. If you don't have this checked, it's gonna import all those old pictures again. You have duplicate copies of them in your catalog. Uh, so leaving this check, when you bring this up, it will automatically unselect the ones that it sees are duplicates. Uh, you can also have it 
dump multiple copies, never use that. You can have it add to a collection. And this is what we talked about. When you're importing, you should check this and you should tell it, I'm gonna create a new collection somewhere uh, and give it a name um, and have it put the pictures in there. I'm not gonna do that for this, despite just telling you to do that. But that's a way so that as you bring things in, that are sort of automatically going to how you want them organized. And don't worry about having to delete stuff later. We'll go through that. This section allows you to rename your physical files as you bring them in. Uh, you may have some process where you always like to have your files named based on the date and based on you know, whatever else. It's got some rules for that, some templates. I never use this. I just bring things in as they're named on the camera. I have each of my cameras has a different prefix, so I don't have to worry about different cameras colliding when I bring things in. Because very often, Kathy and I will go out and shoot with two different cameras. And then when I import everything, I'll import it all into Lightroom. Um, so if you do multiple cameras, that could be a way of having files not collide. By colliding, I mean have the same file name being used by both cameras and you bring it into the same folder, it won't work. And so you'll have to rename one. Um, these are things you can have it automatically do when you're importing. So you could, you could have like a special processing preset and we'll get into presets a little bit more when we go into the develop module, but you can have it automatically apply those changes when you bring the picture in. I generally don't do that. Uh, and then metadata, you can have it set up a pre-can set of metadata. This is useful if you've got say copyright information that you wanna bring in every time you import a picture or some other stuff that you want tagged into your pictures. You just do that and it would automatically get tagged into every picture. You most often see that when people want their copyright slapped on their pictures when they bring them in. The only caveat about that is if you're importing somebody else's pictures to work on for them and you forget that you got that on there, you're gonna be slapping your copyright on their pictures and some people are unhappy about that. Mm -hmm. Oh, one other caveat. Um, every now and then I would send pictures to people and they would go get them printed at the store and the store would refuse to print them unless they had my permission. And they all thought it was because the pictures looked professional. The reality is it was because I'd slapped my copyright on there and that's what they were looking for. So if oh, you so want your friends to think your pictures look really professional, <laughs> you're gonna print them, stick a copyright on there. If you don't want the hassle of having to send them signed forms, then take it off. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can also do that when you export. You can have it not put that on there when you export. Okay, and this last part here is the destination. This is where the picture's gonna go on your computer. It most of the time remembers where you told it you wanted your pictures to go, but when you give it a new memory card or new camera, it forgets and it decides to put them wherever it wants, which for me is the wrong place, which is a pain. So it's good to do a quick check to make sure they're going to the right place. And you have different ways you can organize them. You can just tell it to drop it all into one folder. Um, I have, whoops, clicked on the wrong thing. I have mine set to um, automatically go in based on date. So every time I import pictures, it creates a folder for the year, a folder for the month and a folder for the day. And it puts everything in there. And that sounds like it'd be a nightmare. And it kind of is when you're going out into Explorer or Finder and you're looking through all those folders, but I never or almost never do that. I do everything through Lightroom. And so I don't care how they're stored on the disk that much other than this system makes sure that I don't ever have too many pictures in one folder because that can sometimes bog down the operating system. And there are times when we will shoot 3,000 pictures in a day if we're doing a photo shoot or an outing or something. Not 3,000 good pictures, but 3,000 pictures. So, and this main pane here just shows you these are the pictures that I'm going to import. And I've got all the typical abilities to select and unselect, or I can unselect and then hold shift and click, I guess I can't. Um, that's odd. Um, I can right click, uh, lots of, oh, here we go. I can uncheck all, I can check all, just the basics. But this is how you control what you're bringing in. 99% of the time, you're just gonna click over here, tell what you want. It's gonna bring all the pictures up and you're gonna be good to go. 
The only time that uh, that might not be case is sometimes I'll take like a few pictures just when I'm setting up, trying to get the exposure right, whatever, and I don't want to import those. So it's good to be able to go uncheck those. Uh, you've also got some sorting capabilities, and you'll see this in other places, but I can look at them. I've never used this other than by capture time, but I could look at them by other sorts, or I could look at them in reverse order. Um, and on all these sorts of screens where you see a grid of pictures, you've got the ability to adjust the size of the pictures in there, which can be handy, not so much on this screen, but when we get to the library screen. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and import these pictures now. And now when I look at my catalog section up here, you can see I have a previous import collection. And that's the pictures that just came in. If I do another import, these will all disappear from this collection and they'll just be in my all photographs. They're still in my all photographs. If I go there, I can see these pictures. Um, but I can easily see just the ones I imported here. Some other things that it's done, well, it won't go through that in, in time. Trying to jump ahead of myself. Okay, so we got these pictures in here, and now I want to talk about this main pane here, this this central section of my library. What you're seeing right now is the grid view, and that allows me to see lots of pictures. I can make them small, which is more interesting if I have a lot of pictures. Um, I can make them very large, and I use different settings of this for different things. If I'm trying to go and find a particular picture, a lot of times I'll make it small so I can see more pictures at once. If I'm trying to go through my pictures and see which ones I want to keep, I'll do my first pass here with the thumbnails relatively large and I can just easily get the ones where I cut off somebody's head or I was way out of focus. It's just easy to go through and pick those and get rid of those. Oops. if I've got the pictures relatively large, I can see more that way. Uh, but obviously the larger you have it, the fewer pictures you can see on the screen at once. These are the different views that I have though. I have, that's the grid view. And that little G in parentheses afterwards says that G is a shortcut key that will take you to that view. And with anything Lightroom or Photoshop, you really wanna learn your shortcut keys. They'll save you a lot of time. The loop view shows me a single picture at a time. and that's just, you know, it is what it is. It's easy to see one picture. I can zoom in by clicking. I've got the little hand. I can drag pictures around. Um, this compare view, I don't have a good pair of photos to compare, but if I have two versions of the same photo, they've been processed differently, or I took like three shots in rapid succession and I'm trying to see which one I want, the compare view allows me to see the pictures and look at them simultaneously. Now, when these are different pictures, it's not very useful, but if you can imagine these being two nearly identical pictures, it allows me to, like, let's say it's a group picture. I kind of quickly go through and see is there, which picture do most people have their eyes open and things like that. I'll be honest, I never use it. Survey view I use, that let's say you have five pictures, or in this case, six pictures, and you're trying to choose the one you want. So it's six pictures of roughly the same thing. You, you select them all down here in your film strip, and then you go to the, your survey view, and you can just X out the ones that aren't the ones that you want. And it keeps rearranging and making the pictures as large as possible until you finally get to what you want, which is, of course, the pizza. <laughs> and then the last view here is the, um, the face view. And this is where it's done facial recognition. It hasn't done a very good job of it here. Um, but it has tried to figure out who these people, where do you have faces in the picture? And based on other pictures that you have cataloged, who are these people? And here you can come through and you can say, okay, yes, that's Dante. And that's Eric. That is not daughter Hillborn. That's Eric. It's not Peter Pope. That's Eric. And that's Kathy. Uh, but it didn't see a face in this picture. 
and so it didn't do the facial recognition on it. I can come here and I can draw a face and then I can give it a name. The plus side is it allows you to get that facial recognition in there. The downside is if you only have a few pictures of that person and you've done this, it's going to make it harder for it to recognize that person in the future unless they're wearing a gas mask or whatever's <laughs> causing it not to recognize it. It will also recognize a lot of random things that are faces that it thinks are faces that aren't. Uh, that's amusing. Uh, it will confuse certain people. Uh, you see it most often amongst relatives, uh, but not always. Sometimes it's just two total strangers that it thinks are similar. Okay, I mentioned the navigator earlier. We've got this navigator pane up here, and that's really useful when I'm in the loop view and I'm zoomed in. Let's here, let's go to a one-to-one. -one. This navigator shows me what part of the picture is being shown and it allows me to move this around so that I can look at different parts of the picture there. Alternatively, I can just use the uh, hand and move the picture. And the smooth scrolling works best if you have a, a good video card, but it works reasonably well with almost anything. You have these other options up here on the navigator pane for how you want to size your picture. Fit will scale the picture so the entire picture fits into the window. Fill will scale the picture so that the width of the picture fits into the window, but not necessarily the top or bottom of it. Um, one to one will zoom in so that every pixel in the image is the equivalent of one pixel on your screen. And then you have the ability to zoom different levels. Typically, I'll do like a two to one when I want to get in closer than the pixel level. And I do this when I'm in the editing module and we'll, we'll probably run into some cases of that later. I, some of these like 11, well, I have no idea why anybody would ever want that, but, but typically you're just going to use fit. I use fit and one to one almost all the time and then occasionally two to one or three to one. Okay, so that is the main library window. Let's talk about the toolbar down here. So on the uh, toolbar, it changes based on what view I'm on. But the main things you'll see on here are this spray can, which allows me to set up a keyword. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to create a test keyword here and then I can put that keyword on whatever pictures I want. Um, it's a quick way to keyword. You can also spray other settings on there. I use it for keywords occasionally. I've never used it for anything else but it can be done. Um, I've got my ability to sort. Again almost all the time I have it sorted to capture time but every now and then uh, I'll want to sort it by added order or something if I have a camera that, you know, the date was set to eight years ago or 10 years from now or something and I'm trying to find where did that picture go. Um, and then it, I think I've used this once where you could go look at, okay, let me see things in order of what I've, when I've edited them. Maybe you've, you're working through a collection, you're doing edits on them and now you're trying to figure out, okay, which ones haven't I edited? So let's sort it by edit time. I don't know, don't use that. Um, you've got the ability to flag your pictures and we'll talk about that very soon and set ratings for them. We already talked about the thumbnail thing. Okay, these flags, these stars and these color things over here, they're called attributes. You set those on a picture. Um, if this is a picture that I wanna keep, I might flag it as a pick. And, and this is the way I use this. This is the way it was intended to be used. But these are settings you can put on pictures to mean whatever you want. If you want to only flag pictures that have flags in them, knock yourself out. But the general intent is, as I'm going through a bunch of pictures that I took, 
I'm going to click on pick for the ones that I want or hit the P key. I'm going to click on reject or hit the X key for the pictures that I don't want. And what I do to make it even more efficient is you can set filters and I'm going to filter here. I can filter to show me picked pictures, pictures that haven't been flagged one way or the other yet or rejected pictures. Right now I've got them all set, but let's turn off everything except for the unfiltered pictures. Now what I can do is I can go through here and I can say, yeah, I want to keep that picture. No, I don't want that picture. Yes, I want that picture. And you can see as I decide what I want to do with the picture, it's filtering it out so that I no longer see it in my film strip and I no longer see it on the screen. And so imagine you get back from a photo shoot, you got 300 pictures and you want to quickly get it down to the 30 or so that you want to keep. By just sitting here and pressing the P and the X key, you can quickly knock out a whole bunch of pictures. A lot of times I'll do it, I'll go through multiple sets. I'll, I'll do all my picks and rejects, then I'll go back and I'll filter to show me only the picks. I'll select all those and I will hit the, uh, the uh, U key, I think it is, to unselect them. And then I'll go back through and I'll pick and reject those again. You know, it's just iterations to, to quickly get to just the pictures that you want. In this case, I'm gonna show us everything. Um, stars are similar, and except that stars, you tell it kind of how much you like that picture. The idea is, you know, you might have your one star pictures or marginal, all of your five star pictures. Those are the ones you're most proud of. Uh, again, you can use it for however you want. A lot of times what I'll do, I'll do a photo shoot for a family. I'll go through and reject the pictures that are so bad I don't want them to see them. I'll take all the rest of the pictures and I'll upload them for them to look at. They'll send me back the ones that they liked and I'll put one star for each of those. Then I'll go through and I'll edit those pictures and I'll take the new versions and I'll put two stars for those. And that allows me to keep track of what were my sort of original ones they liked and then what are the ones that I've improved and don't like. But however you wanna use it, the way it works is you just click on one star or you press the numbers one, two, three, four, five. We pick whatever star rating you want on there. This of course is a five star picture. Um, this is a two star picture. That's a three star picture. So now I can go to my grid view and I can say, show me only pictures that have at least one star. Okay, show me only pictures that have at least two stars, three stars, four stars, five stars. I can't say show me all the one star pictures. That's kind of an odd limitation. It's only that many stars or greater. Um, it's a relatively useful tool. Like I said, the main things I use it for are keeping track of sort of unprocessed and processed pictures. And then also I'll put like four or five stars on pictures that I like a lot so I can find them easier later. And later I'll wonder why I gave this one five stars, but. Okay, let me clear my filters. Um, there's an easier way to do that. I think you can just come down here. You can say no filter. Yeah, that clears them. Uh, there's another way to do that that I'll show you in a minute. That's what I use, although that's quicker. I just forget to do that. Oh, and then the other part is you can set a color for a picture. So I'm going to set this one to green and this one to red. Uh, why would you set colors? I have no idea, whatever you want. They're just an ad hoc way of grouping. So now I can come down here, I can say, show me only my green pictures or show you my green and red pictures or whatever. So some things I've used it for in the past, uh, I want to go through and delete a bunch of pictures. So I go through and I highlight them all as uh, red. Uh, and then I go look at those and I make sure, okay, those are the ones that I want, then I set them to reject and I delete them that way. Uh, I've done, green for pictures I want to put into a slideshow, for example, or things that it's just whatever it is that you want to use to kind of call out those pictures to have some special meaning. Keep in mind, you also have your keywords you can use and you have your ability to put things in collections. So if you're relying on colors a lot, I, I 
question why. Okay, we talked a bit, a little bit about the filtering here. This is the ability to filter based on flagging. This is the ability to filter based on whether you've edited the picture or not. Um, this is the ability to filter based on stars. This is the ability to filter based on colors. And these are some pre-built sets of filters. Uh, and what they'll do is open up your main filter pane, which, did I do something? Here we go. Uh, the backward slash key, the one that's from the top left to the bottom right, uh, opens up this pane here of filters. I always press the forward slash key and then the backward slash key. You don't need to do that. I just always forget which slash it is. So um, backward slash brings that up. It gives you the ability to set up to four different things in your filter here, and you can choose what you want those to be. I generally always use date as the first one, um, and then the other ones are kind of random. Do I want to filter by camera? Do I want to filter by, um, you know, whatever. You've got lots of things you can filter by. Let me filter by city. Now, this is interesting. Notice it put these things in based on the GPS location on the images. Uh, there's a setting. Ooh, let me see if I can remember where it is. Yes, under edit catalog settings, there's a checkbox for look up city, state, and country of GPS coordinates to provide address suggestions. If you have that checked, when you import pictures that have GPS information, which is mostly just either very new SLRs or cell phone cameras, it will automatically figure out what city to apply to that. Um, so anyway, I can come here and I can say, I only want, this will be more useful if I do the all photos collection. I only want pictures from, okay, it's probably trying to figure everything out right now. I can go pick a particular month, April, let's do January of 2010. These are the pictures I had then. I don't even, I've never owned a Rebel XSI, so I don't know what these are or whose these are. <laughs> Somebody gave us those. Um, but I, can, I can filter things like this. I use this in a lot of different weird ways. It also gives you um, counts. And so an example of a, a weird way to use this is to filter by lens. Let's take the 24 to 105 and then filter by focal length. And I can look and see, okay, with that zoom lens, 35 of my pictures were taken at, as full wide open and not very many were taken at uh, full zoom. So that tells me at least for that shoot, I was constrained more on the wide side than the long side. And then I tend to use, so if you're trying to figure out, do I really need a longer lens? Well, how often are you shooting at the maximum zoom? You can look and actually look at the data and see. Okay, so that's filtering by, at, for filtering by metadata. You have other choices here. You can filter by text. So I can filter based on text in all these different things. Usually I set it to keywords. And if I wanna filter by butterfly, for example, it will bring back all the pictures from 2010 that have butterflies in them. Or I can just get rid of the other filters and say, bring back all butterfly pictures. Again, it wasn't smart enough to know these are butterflies. I had to tell each, each of these was a butterfly. So don't get too excited about the keywording unless you're willing to commit a lot of time to it. Um, so that's the text searching. I also have attribute searching, which is what we saw down below, but with one bonus here, I can filter based on whether something is, I can't see what's popping up here, whether something is a master photo and that's not a good photo, that's just a photo that you imported in, uh, whether it's a virtual copy. So that's when I take a photo and I make a copy of it in Lightroom. And we'll go into this in more detail in the develop section, but that's a 
copy in Lightroom where it's the same picture on the disk. Remember I said it just saves all the changes that I've made, the instructions? Well, I can have two sets of instructions. So I might process a picture up one way in color and process it another way in black and white and have two different uh, copies of it, one's virtual another. Where I use this all the time is virtual copies. I'll create different aspect ratios. So if I've got a picture and I wanna be able to print it as an eight by 10 or as a five by seven or an 11 by 14, those are all different crops of the same picture. And so I'll create a separate virtual copy for each of the different crops. And this allows you to filter to just those virtual crop copies. And then the other one here is the filter to videos. Um, for me, nine times out of 10, I'm doing this to filter out videos, but um, you can filter them in. So those are your attributes. The metadata again was the ones where you pick what you want to filter on and then you pick those. And then none is the other way to just reset, get rid of all your filters and go back to nothing but photographs. Okay, so that covers filtering. Now let's talk about the film strip down at the bottom because this gets used all the time. It, it goes through all of your modules and this shows you all the pictures that you have active. In this case, it's all photos, but let's go back to the previous import. This now shows me all the pictures in my previous import um, or whatever catalog I have selected. It allows me to select pictures here. Right now I've got this one selected, but I can hold down control and click on other pictures and select those. You notice they select in this pane as well. Um, it tells me how many pictures I have. And if I filter out some pictures, it tells me I have, it remembers your filter session settings sometimes too in awkward ways. Okay, now I've filtered to only show my unselected and my flagged, I'm sorry, my unflagged and my flag, but not my rejects. So it has filtered out one picture, so I only have six of the seven. And of those, I have three selected. So you have three numbers here. One is how many pictures are showing on the film strip. The next is how many pictures are in the catalog that I'm looking at. And then the next one is how many of those pictures that are showing are selected. I can also, I can make the film strip bigger if I want. All these panes are resizable. And I can do things like go through and rate my pictures right here on the film strip. Well, I thought I could. Um, I can add them to my quick collection or not here. So there's lots of little things like that you can do directly on the film strip. Apparently you can't do ratings anymore though. Hmm. Uh, let's see what else. Down here is where you do the second monitor. So if I wanted to, I could click on this and it would, I don't know if you guys can see that, it opened up another window on this monitor um, showing me just my image. Normally you would have that open up onto a second monitor so you could have your grid view and all your settings and stuff on one monitor and then the full view of the picture on a second monitor. That is the film strip. Okay, this upper right hand corner. This is my histogram. We'll talk about this a lot more in the develop section, but basically this just shows me the exposure of the picture. Everything from this left side is the darkest parts of the picture to the right side is the brightest parts of the picture. And it gives me kind of a, okay, I have a lot of blue that's somewhat dark. Uh, you know, if I had a picture that was too bright, it would have a lot of stuff right here on the right edge. We'll go into more of what a histogram does in the develop section. They're really cool. This also tells me what my ISO was, what my focal length was, what my aperture was. For anybody used to using real cameras, I know these numbers look really weird, but that's cell phones have teeny tiny sensors. And so 4.4 millimeters is actually a relatively normal focal length for them. Uh, and what my shutter speed was. You tend not to use the histogram at all in the library module. I don't know why they put it there. You'll use it in the develop module a lot. Down below it, I have quick develop settings. These do things that you can do in the develop module. The only reason why they're here is if I want, I can select all the pictures or set of the pictures here, and then I can 
do like a mass increase of my exposure. And it does it for all the pictures at once, whereas the develop module works on one picture at a time. Tend not to use this too much unless I see that like I've underexposed a whole bunch of pictures or I want to make some mass adjustment, but usually I don't use this. Now down here is the keywording section. And we talked a little bit about the facial recognition part. This is where you can put in other keywords. I tag them all with Dallas test. Uh, the facial recognition stuff shows up with keywords, Dante and Eric. Uh, I can add more keywords here. If I want, I can say bench. There's now a bench keyword on this because they're sitting on a bench. Uh, I could put flowers because there are flowers in the background. Um, yeah, I've got flowers in hierarchies, which is why that shows up funny like that. Um, I've got flowers in different ways, so we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. But this is where I can type in keywords. It has automatic suggestions for keywords. It doesn't do the suggestions based on what it sees in the image. It does the suggestions based on what keywords have I used recently? What keywords do you tend to use with the other keywords that you've put in here? So like flowers, okay, there are a lot of flowers, keywords in Bouchard Gardens, so it suggested that. Um, it's not very smart. It's, it's disappointing that they don't have better AI to automatically tell you what things it sees in there. My guess is you would have to have it be cloud-based for that to work well though or use a lot of bandwidth. So, But these make it easy. If I wanted to tag Kathy in this picture, I could just click on it and it would add her name in there. I'm confusing because she's not in that picture. Um, and don't do like people do on Facebook and tag people who aren't in the picture because you want them to see it or something. Just tag what's in your actual picture. Mm -hmm. um, you can do that on Facebook. I'm not editorializing about that. It's just It makes no sense in the context, context of Lightroom. Uh, and then these are keyword sets that you can use. They're so limited in use, I've never used them, but uh, they allow you to just create sort of a, a three by three grid of extra keywords that you can use so that, I don't know, let's use the Maker Barn as an example. If there's nine pieces of equipment that appear in a lot of pictures and you want to easily keyword them, you could have Maker Barn equipment as a set. Um, which you would define by coming here and going to edit set. Um, and then you can uh, put in those pieces of equipment and easily tag them by clicking on here. Once you have everything keyworded, you have this section here that's your keyword list. Oh, I should explain one other thing. You notice when I clicked on this, keyword list closed, and when I clicked on this, keywording closed. That's because I have solo mode turned on for this pane. You can toggle it on and off. If it's off, you can have multiple sections open at once. And when it's on, you can only have one open at once and it will automatically close the open one for you. It's just a usability thing. For some of the panes, there's so much stuff on there that if you don't have solo on, you know, with tons of stuff open and you're scrolling all the time. So I leave it on on a lot of them, but you don't have to. Uh, this is my set of keywords. I've got them here. Let me get rid of the junk one that I added. This is how I have them organized. It automatically creates a people one for you when you start tagging people. Um, but it'll just drop them in directly under people. And I find it gets unwieldy to have too many people in one spot. Like, let's look at animals. You got, you starting to get, well, nah, better idea. Let's go look at coworkers. It's a lot of people all in one thing. Imagine if I had everybody in there, you'd be scrolling forever. And even there, I've got like whole families grouped together. So when you're keywording, it will drop everything into this keyword list at the top level. You can just come through here and click on add and add another keyword, or I'll just right click on places and say, uh, let's see, create keyword tag inside people. Um, people I don't like. 
and you could create a set under there. And then you can start to add, you could drag, let's say, I don't like the Wicked Witch. I could drag that keyword under there and now it's in there. These hierarchies are useful for more than just that though. When I stick something, let's use a butterfly as an example. If I tag a keyword as a blue morpho, if I tag a picture as having a blue morpho in it, it's automatically going to get the keyword blue morpho. I mean, it, it's got the keyword blue morpho, but it's automatically going to also get things that inherit from that. So a blue morpho is a butterfly, it'll automatically get that. A butterfly is an insect, so it'll automatically get that. And an insect is an animal, so it'll automatically get that. Why? Because I have this hierarchy I built where I said, okay, animal's my top level one, insects below that, butterflies below that, and blue morphos below that. So when I assign blue morpho to that picture, I don't have to assign butterfly and insect and animal, but it will automatically come up for those things. I can still assign things directly. I have one thing that's assigned directly to insect, presumably because I have no idea what kind of insect it is. Oh no, that's a problem. It's just gonna show me everything that's got insect on it. And I'll never know what picture that was. Um, but hierarchies allow you to have that ability to add lots of keywords with one keyword. So the main hierarchies I use the ones I use the most are people and location. Location, and I started doing this before it automatically tagged um, places like Dallas and stuff for me. So those don't even appear here as keywords. That's actually metadata stored on the image. I probably dropped doing a lot of this, but uh, it's just a way to start tagging things that if I want to tag something at our elementary school, it automatically gets the fact that it's in woodland, the woodlands and automatic gets back that it's in Texas and the United States. Uh, if I ever want to search on what are the pictures I have for some higher level thing, I get that for free. The whole purpose of this keywording is, well, let's talk about that for a second. There's two purposes. One is filtering within Lightroom so you can find the pictures you want. The other thing is when you export a picture, you can send those keywords with it. And that has a lot of interesting value and some drawbacks. Uh, let's say I've done a photo shoot of some children uh, for one of the neighbors and I give them those pictures. If I export it with all that metadata in there, those children's name, what family they're part of, where we were when we took the picture, all that information, and then somebody 30 years from now, their grandchildren or their niece or somebody has that picture, they have that information with it. So they can look up, they see who was that person? You know, I'm going through some slides my dad took in the 1950s and we have no idea who those people were. There was no easy way to store metadata with those pictures then, but now we can. So it, it makes it richer. It's also good for stock photographers. For anybody who's trying to sell their images, People only buy images they can find. And so the more you keyword it, the more people will be able to find your images uh, to search for them. So it's great for getting things to come up in searches. The caveat is they're privacy issues. I mean, going back to that example of the picture that I gave my neighbor with their children's names in it. I don't know that they want their children's names in that picture. They may want to post that anonymously somewhere on some social media website that they've got their names not associated with, they just got a generic avatar or something. They post that picture out there, somebody downloads that picture, well now they know where they live, they know who their children are in the picture. You know, there's information like that that they may not even be aware is in the picture. So, and I don't know what Adobe does with it. Adobe may never look at my metadata at all. They may be gathering up all the facial recognition data and sending it off to Bulgaria or something. I, I don't know. Um, so, you know, keywords, pros and cons. I think they're extremely useful. 
for my stuff, I, I want the keywords in there a lot more than I put in there uh, so that people can understand the context of those pictures in the future. But you do have to be sensitive, particularly with other people and particularly with other people's children around potential privacy concerns that they may have. Okay, going through my notes. Let's look at a keyword. We'll go look at me. For a keyword, I've got a keyword name. Um, I've also got synonyms. So uh, if I had a nickname like that damn Barbieri that I wanted to appear on pictures, I could put that in there. So, you know, that could be useful if like my mother, her name is Sandra Barbieri, but she goes by Sandy. So I could have both of those in there to make it easy to search either way. Um, you know, you could, it's not just names, nicknames for people. You could have things that get called multiple things like, well, if you want to keyword something as a picture, having a picture in the picture, you could put a synonym for picture as photo or photograph or both of them. You could put a comma separated list. You could say uh, sin one, sin two, they'll all go in there as separate synonyms. Um, you can control whether that keyword is exported. So for example, the location keyword it does not get exported because it doesn't really add any value to anybody for the, somebody to know that, oh, that picture has a location. Um, it's only when you get down to meaningful things that uh, things that you want part of the picture that you would have included on export. Export containing keywords, uh, that's what controls where the hierarchy above that is included. So in this one, when it gets exported, it has my name, it has immediate family tagged in there, it has family tagged in there, it has people tagged in there. All right, that's probably not that useful, but uh, in other circumstances like the butterfly, having the uh, containing keywords exported with it is useful. This way, if somebody's going through my JPEGs later without Lightroom and they're trying to find, does he have any pictures of insects? Those will come up. Uh, export synonyms is exactly what you think it is. It's, does it include the synonyms? And then is this a person is a check box. They added that relatively recently when they did the facial recognition. I don't know what it does. Um, I think it, autom it automatically gets added when you do facial recognition and it automatically assigns it to anything that goes under people. But I don't know any real functionality they have with it. Uh, the weird thing about include on export, but it also has export synonyms. They took this out for a little while. Um, you couldn't export synonyms if you didn't export the keyword itself, but they added that back in. I was one of the rabble rousers for that because I had a friend who keywords all the kids on her soccer team's names in, their, in her pictures in Lightroom. But again, for privacy reasons, she didn't want to put those names out in the pictures but she had as a synonym on there, their team number, their, their player number on their team and their team name. So this way she could post all the pictures on Smug Mug and then Smug Mug allows you to also do filtering and create sort of the Smug Mug equivalent of smart collections. And she could have a smart collection that would filter on each player's number and that player's team name in the year they played and send that to the parents. And then as she added pictures, it would automatically be a, a, a collection on, they could go to that would show all the pictures that had their kid in them, but not including the name itself. So I thought that was a very clever use. Okay, after keyword list, you have a metadata section. Um, and this is just what gets stored with the image. So let's go back to previous import and we have a filter set somewhere. Uh, filters off. So I can look at things like the EXIF data. Every time you take a picture with a modern camera, it stores a ton of information. When was the picture taken? Uh, what was the exposure setting? What was, you know, did the flash fire? What model camera it was? 
uh, usually even has the serial number of the camera somewhere in there. Um, so if your camera ever gets stolen and people start posting, you can go do uh, searches out on the internet and look for that serial number so you can find who's got your camera. Good luck having the police do anything about it, but you can do it. Um, but it's got all this information stored in there in the EXIF data. It's also got IPTC data, which is generally where you store like your copyright information. Uh, this stuff, when I, when I selected the Mark Barbieri metadata set when I imported it, it automatically added this stuff so that if somebody sees that picture in the late, somewhere on the internet and they want to email the person who took it, they'll have my email address in the picture. Um, it's got the location information. I said it doesn't go in as a keyword, it goes in here. So you could search for it that way. And yeah, location information was on the IPTC. So all this stuff that gets stored in there. So that's this metadata section. And then this comment section, I had to go look this up. I've never used this, but I think for some publishing services, if I'm looking at a picture, say, on SmugMug, because it allows you to put comments on pictures, I can put comments here, and then when I upload them, those comments go up with the picture. I don't know where the round trips, whether it brings the comments back down with it, if other people comment on your picture. I have no idea. But So I've never used that. Don't know anything about it. OK, so that is getting pictures in, looking at pictures, doing all that. Let's talk now about getting pictures out. And there's a few ways to do that. You've got export, export with previous, export with preset, which I've never used. Um, I say that, but I've got a user preset in there. Huh, maybe I did. Uh, and export is catalog. Export is what I do when I'm not directly publishing. This is. This is where I'm trying to get pictures onto my computer. And I can put them directly onto my computer. I have no idea what happens if you tell it you want to export to email. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I don't know if any of you guys remember, there used to be these disc things called CDs and DVDs. I guess this had something to do with those. I don't know, I just always use hard drive. Uh, let's see, so you've got sections on here for export location. This is where do you want it to go on your hard drive? You can tell it to go to a specific folder, directly to your desktop, whatever. Um, right now, it just remembers where you set the last ones to. Right now, it's set to go to my desktop. I can say, okay, create a subfolder under there called Butterfly. Uh, it'll go there. Add to this catalog. That's a little bit circular, but when it exports the pictures out to a location, it will then automatically add that location in those pictures back into Lightroom. So you have extra copies of your pictures. I've never done that. Uh, can't think of a use case, but somebody must have one. Uh, and then this existing files is, if you already have files there with the same name, what do I do when there's a collision? Uh, you can just overwrite, you can skip them. I always just leave it as ask what to do so that I, then it'll give me the option. Uh, renaming, you can set some renaming rules. So you automatically rename all of your files as they're exported. Uh, looks like the last time I did it, I had it set to append the year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and then a dash in the file name. Um, I don't use that very often, but if you want to rename your files when they get exported, there's your place to do it. Uh, Never used the video section, never used it to export video. File settings, this is where you tell what kind of file you want to export it as. 99 times out of 100, you can export as a JPEG um, because if you're using a PSD or a TIFF or something, you're probably working within Lightroom and Photoshop. You, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna edit something in Photoshop, you edit it by right-clicking on the image and saying edited Photoshop. You don't export it somewhere and then go open it up in Photoshop. That's just too much trouble. Color space, well, we could talk a lot about color spaces. Uh, if you're gonna export as a JPEG to show on another computer or display or put it on the web, you want sRGB, otherwise it's likely not to be 
people are going to see a weird looking version of it. The colors will be wrong. If you're going to export it to print out, um, then you probably want to export it to Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB. Uh, and maybe we can talk about color spaces in the develop module, but it's kind of a funky topic. Quality is how it won't actually make your picture a better picture. Uh, but it is just how much compression you use when you export your JPEG. If you make it lower quality, the file size will be smaller, but the picture, picture will look more crummy. Uh, I found 80 is a reasonable compromise. If your quality goes much higher than that, your file starts to get relatively large and you don't see much difference. And again, if you were round tripping, if you were opening up a JPEG, editing it, saving the JPEG, and then opening that up and editing it, saving it. Yeah, you're, you really want, well, you don't want to do that. And if you do, you want all the quality you can get. Um, but Lightroom doesn't do that. So, you know, adjust for whatever quality settings you need. And then this limit file size, I almost never use that. But every now and then, you got to upload a picture to a site. And you do that and it says, whoa, that picture was... 3.6 megabytes and I'll only let you upload a picture that's 2.5 megabytes. You would come here and you would say, all right, change it to 2,500. And this way it overrides the quality setting. It says, okay, that's as big as I'll make the file. All right. Output sharpening. Every time you change the resolution of an image or change its format, you really want to sharpen it. And it, 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 the, it's kind of a complex thing, but when you bring your pictures into Lightroom, behind the scenes, it automatically sharpens them for you. And if you print out of Lightroom, it automatically sharpens you for the print that you're making. But if you're exporting them, it doesn't know what your purpose is. And so here's where you tell it what your purpose is. Are you going to sharpen it to show on the screen, to print on matte paper, print on glossy paper? And it'll sharpen it different ways for different things. The one caveat I'll have on there is, oh, we forgot the image sizing section. Uh, if you're going to sharpen it, if you're going to export it at full resolution, so it's going to be a 32 megapixel image, and you sharpen for screen, that only makes sense for people who are going to look at the image on a 32 megapixel screen, which doesn't even exist. Um, so I would only use screen if you're already resizing it to fit at the way you want it to display on somebody's screen. This image sizing section, this is where if you, you're exporting the picture and you've got a particular target in mind. You want to display this on a web page and you want the image to be 640 pixels by 480 pixels or something like that. Uh, you would go here and you would resize it to uh, fit whatever dimensions you want. If you don't want it to resize, you want it to just send out the full size image then just leave that unchecked, but don't sharpen for screen if you do that. And then metadata, I talked about this is where you can do things like, ah, I bet this is what the people checkbox does. You can remove all the people metadata if you want. You can remove the location information. And these are the two that are most privacy sensitive. If you're working with somebody else's pictures that, that were taken at their house or something, be careful before you export a picture with their names and their location on there because they might not appreciate the fact that you came over and did that great new jewelry shoot of theirs uh, and they didn't know when they posted their jewelry anonymously on jewelers.com, it was gonna tell people who they were and where they lived. Um, and write keywords is a Lightroom hierarchy. I, I read up on this, I still don't know what it does. Don't do it. And then watermark. Sometimes you see pictures with those really ugly uh, watermarks written across them uh, so that people can't steal your picture without having to Photoshop out your watermark. Uh, this is what allows you to do that. Um, I've never done it, but knock yourself out if you want to. And then this last section is you can have it automatically open up a window and explore or do something like that whenever it's done exporting. So those are the main things you do when you export. It remembers what you did the last time, so you don't have to sit here and go through and take setting after setting after setting. You find that you mostly do the same stuff over and over. 
And as a matter of fact, that's what the next export option is. Export with previous doesn't ask you any questions. It just exports with whatever the settings were the last time you did an export. Uh, export with preset, never used it. Other than maybe when I did that Google Photos one, don't know what it does. Uh, export as catalog, we talked about that earlier. You've done all this editing in Lightroom, um, but you wanna give somebody the original unedited pictures, plus all the information on your edits, plus all your keywords and all that other stuff, um, or you wanna save that off somewhere. Uh, you make that setting, you export it as a catalog, and then somebody can open that in Lightroom and have all that information. Hmm. And then the last way to get pictures out are these publishing services. And I don't want to spend time on that because everybody's got different ways to publish. Um, and they're all, the rules are all different for how these things work. Uh, but uh, yeah, just a quick look for smug mugs. They do things based on galleries. Uh, and yeah, I can fill out sort of the things that smug mug needs for its exports. But if I were to export to, if, yeah, Facebook still supported that. Um, that looks like it doesn't even come up anymore. Uh, oh well, it would ask totally different questions and have things totally separate ways. Maybe Instagram, oh, I don't even have the Instagram plugin on here anymore. Um, let's see, what else did I wanna cover on here? Exiting Lightroom. So when you go to exit Lightroom, there's a setting that you probably want to set in your catalog settings. Backup catalog. You, after you put all this time and energy into keywording and editing and doing all this and organizing all your pictures, you hate to lose that by losing your copy of Lightroom. So you can set it up to do backups. By default, I think it backs up, it wants to back up once a week. So if it's been a week since you've done your last backup in Lightroom and you exit Lightroom, it will say, hey, do you want to back up? And you have the option of skipping or backing up. Um, I set mine to just ask me that every single time I exit. This way, if I'm going to bed, going to do something else, I just let it back up. Um, if I'm going to do something else right now and I don't want Lightroom to sit there and churn for a minute or two backing up and you know, checking, because you can also have it check the catalog for consistency and things like that. I don't want to have it waste time that I skip it, but this allows me to do fairly regular backups. It's just backing up to wherever you said to back it up to though. And just to get a little bit off a of Lightroom and onto a soapbox for a second. I constantly see people say things like, oh my God, my drive failed and please help me rescue this drive. This has all the photos I've had of my child since they were born. Like, and you didn't have it backed up? <laughs> I don't understand why people don't. So don't just back up your Lightroom catalog to your computer. Back up all your photos and your catalog someplace outside your home. That can be using a pair of external drives and you just back up everything up to your external drive and you carry, carry one of those drives to your office. Well, sorry, that's an anachronism. Back in the days when people used to work outside the home, um, you could do that, take it to your office and then bring the one that was at your office home. So you always have one there and you got two copies. Uh, the easier thing to do is just sign up for an online backup service. Uh, there's a lot of good ones out there. We use Backblaze, I'm very happy with them. I don't wanna say they're the only one or the best or anything. They're just who we're comfortable with. It's $60 a year. They hate the fact that I take advantage of it, but that's for unlimited storage. I literally have 11 terabytes of photos and videos backed up on Backblaze for $60 a year. So it does use up some internet bandwidth to do that, but have all your photos backed up um, somewhere. And while you're backing up your photos, it's also nice to back up your Lightroom catalog somewhere else. If you're, if all your photos are stored in Google Photos or something like that, that's nice for your photos, but your catalog won't be backed up. Okay, that is everything I wanted to cover about the library module in Lightroom. There are 
these other modules, develop, map, book, slideshow, print, and web. I have used these other five so infrequently that I don't even want to teach anything on them. I mean, I can show you map because I use that every now and then. Um, develop, to me, these two are the heart of Lightroom. Develop is where you really edit your pictures. Um, and I'd like to do a full separate class, people are interested, going through a few pictures and showing how to use all the different controls on here and why you would use them and what I use them for. But that'll be for another time. So are there any questions on the library section? Is there any interest in doing a develop session? Yep. 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 Okay. I think that'd be great. I'd like that. Does anybody use Lightroom and do anything different in the library section that they want to mention or talk about? <clears throat> all right. That's all I had. Well, I learned one important thing. I hadn't tried to use it, Lightroom, because I was only familiar with the cloud and I didn't want to put all my photographs up on the cloud. So just learning that there was Lightroom Classic had tremendous value for me. Yeah, it's weird. Adobe, the way they kind of market it and they sell it and they act, it's like Lightroom Classic's the old way. Nobody does that anymore. Lightroom CC, that's the new, that's the thing that you really want. I know probably 25 different people that use Lightroom and I don't know anybody who uses Lightroom CC yet. So it's, and it mostly, not because it's a bad product, it's because, again, I have 11 terabytes, which is unusual, but most people who are photographers who are going to use Lightroom, they're not just using their cell phone. And not that there's anything wrong with cell phone pictures. All, all my pictures in Japan and Italy, well, all the pictures from Japan were cell phone pictures. Um, but they'll, they'll end up with a lot more than, I think, the 25 gigabytes of picture storage they give you there. And so you have to have, so plus, if I go do a photo shoot of like a soccer game and I take a thousand pictures, which isn't that unusual, that's going to be 50 gigabytes of pictures right there. I don't want to have to upload all those to the internet before I can start editing them and work them. I mean, it just seems so slow and cumbersome. So, yes. so I don't get Lightroom CC yet. Security is security and being able to move around from place to place and have access to that from everywhere is the only thing I can imagine. Yeah, there are certainly a lot of conveniences. Oh, one of the things, the security aspect reminds me, one of the things that would be really great for Lightroom to do is to have it be a network, networkable app. So you store your Lightroom database on your NAS or your main computer, and then everybody else in the house or your office, wherever you're at, can all run Lightroom and share that one catalog. Kathy and I both work on the same sets of pictures all the time and Lightroom doesn't support that. And you can kind of do it sometimes, but because it doesn't support it, you're running the risk of corrupting your catalog. So we don't do that. And we just do cumbersome things of, all right, who's gonna do these pictures? You'll take them, I'll take them. And then they end up in one catalog or the other and it's just kind of the way it is. So. I've been waiting for them to come out with a version that does that, but I've been waiting since 2007 and I don't think it's on their radar. So we'll see. All right, well. Thank you so much, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Let's shoot for Wednesday of next week again. Is that a good time? Yeah, okay. perfect. allow us to recover. <laughs> we'll do the develop module. If you think of any questions, um, you know, just ask them, I guess, on Slack or whatever the appropriate communication method is. You want us to send you some bad photos to develop? Um, no. We got I'll, plenty. <laughs> yeah, I'll pick some photos. So. And unlike today where I'm just clicking around through my catalog, so you're seeing tons of stuff that I should have deleted years ago, I'll pick out some good photos that – that show the develop process well and make it look like I'm a better photographer. The <laughs> advice I give to young photographers all or new photographers all the time is, if you want to be a better photographer, the single most important thing to do is to delete lots of pictures. Oh yeah. 
if you if you're showing people i still remember back when people printed pictures when you go get film and you print they felt like they had to keep everything so i, I can't tell you times people were like showing pictures and they go oh yeah this one didn't come out and it's like well, why did you keep it now people take so many pictures it's more intuitive that i can get rid of some of these but you still people will keep way too many pictures if you're keeping more than 10 percent of your pictures you're either a really good photographer or you're just not picky enough and there are circumstances where you know let's say you're i don't know you're taking pictures of a kindergarten graduation or something well you got to keep a picture of every kid you can't tell somebody's parents like nah your kid just didn't photograph well so i deleted that one <laughs> but most stuff delete a lot of your pictures keep the good ones and then people will think you're a better photographer so pre-visualize yeah. <laughs> all right well, thank you all very much thank you till next week all right, all right. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Mark. Bye.